we are delighted to offer you a comprehensive look and listen to the featured works of our upcoming 2021-22 season, the five glorious Beethoven piano concertos, and to our five stellar soloists. Our wonderful assistant conductor, Rebecca Smithhorn, begins this series of BCO Sundays at Three videos with the Piano Concerto Number no. 1, which we'll hear on our opening subscription concert. Welcome back to BCO Sundays at Three. We're going to have the absolute delight of talking through all five of Beethoven's piano concertos together. So let's start at the very beginning with Piano Concerto Number no. 1. Now the thing that I am contractually obligated to tell you and that you will want to remember for your next classical music trivia night is that Piano Concerto Number no. 1 is not actually the first piano concerto that Beethoven wrote. It's the second or the third, depending on who's counting. Beethoven wrote the work known as Piano Concerto Number no. 1 around 1795, several years after writing his Piano Concerto Number no. 2. And before both of those, he wrote a piano concerto in his youth that he thought was terrible and frankly preferred to forget about. Some teenagers have embarrassing yearbook photos, others have early piano concertos that are structurally flawed, but you know, it just goes to show that adolescent awkwardness is a universal experience. In any case, Beethoven decided to publish his Piano Concerto No. 1 first, even though he wrote it second or third, because he thought it was a little bit better and he wanted to start the set off strong. But the first two concertos aren't that far apart in terms of time or style, and they both offer us the opportunity to explore the early days of Beethoven's life, which is an eye-opening thing to explore. Because when you think of Ludwig von Beethoven, you probably think of this guy. Crazy hair, old man Beethoven. And in this case, you can kind of judge the book by the cover. Anton Reicha famously described him as morose, ironical, and misanthropic. And there are tons of accounts that confirm the image of Beethoven as rude, socially inept, and an all-around difficult person to get along with. And it's a persona that has totally dominated the way that Beethoven lives in the popular imagination. But it's a little more complicated than that. For one thing, Beethoven wasn't always like that. He was born in Bonn in 1770, just 14 years after Mozart's birth. And Bonn was a similarly sized city as Mozart's hometown of Salzburg. Not the middle of nowhere, but not the big city of Vienna either, which is where both composers eventually landed. But while Mozart thought of Salzburg as a backwater town that he couldn't wait to escape, Beethoven loved Bonn. He was pretty happy there. And he likely had the intention of returning to Bonn to live, although the chaos of the French Revolution and its aftermath in Europe kind of shut that possibility down. But his father and grandfather were both musicians in the electoral court at Bonn, and Beethoven was on track to carry on the family trade as a court musician, which was the 18th century equivalent of being a company man. Not necessarily the most interesting job in the world, but a very stable, comfortable gig. And he was well liked in the court. In an evaluation of Bond's musicians, he was described as an amiable and light-hearted man who was very capable as a keyboard player and a violist and an especially gifted improviser. He became a salaried member of the court at the age of 14, and his teachers saw a lot of promise in him, so they convinced their boss, the Prince Elector Maximilian Franz, to support a little bit of travel and education for him. When Joseph Haydn visited Bonn in 1792, this was the perfect opportunity. Haydn was 60 years old and his career was still growing. He was a musical superstar. He was headed to London where his famous London symphonies would be premiered. And Haydn was genuinely impressed with the young Beethoven's work and agreed to take him on as a student with the idea that they would travel together to Vienna and then on to London. Lucky for us, Beethoven kept an expense book on his journey, mostly so he could write back to his boss and ask for more money. But from that expense book, we get to see some of the really granular details of his life in Vienna. And it paints a picture of a reasonably friendly, if awkward guy who wants to fit in. He gives his carriage driver generous tips. He buys new stylish clothes when he arrives. 
He looks up the names of dancing teachers to up his social game a bit. He goes to Vienna's very fashionable coffee houses with Haydn. He even has a line in his budget for hair products. So this is not the cranky, disheveled misanthrope we've come to think of as Beethoven. So what changed? Well, part of it, of course, was his tragic hearing loss, but part of it was the real culture shock of suddenly interacting with Vienna's very insulated aristocracy. But we'll talk about that more next time. For now, let's take a look at this fantastic music. Now, when you think of Beethoven the person, you might automatically think of crazy hair Beethoven. When you think of Beethoven's music, you might automatically think of this. <laughs> symphony, the most recognizable piece of music of all time. But just like crazy hair Beethoven doesn't represent his entire biography, the brooding dramatic fifth symphony doesn't represent all of his music. In fact, I'd say it doesn't even represent the majority of Beethoven's music. Remember what was most impressive about the young Beethoven was his ability to improvise at the keyboard. And improvisation always, always has an element of fun to it. It's imaginative, it's surprising, and that's what we see in this first piano concerto. There are times when you can almost hear Beethoven making this up as he goes along, as he likely was. Beethoven performed these concertos himself and barely wrote down the piano part at all for those early performances. One of his contemporaries wrote, I admired his powerful, brilliant playing, but his frequent daring changes from one melody to another, putting aside the organic, gradual development of ideas, did not escape me. Evils of this nature frequently weaken his greatest compositions, those which sprang from a too exuberant fancy. The listener is often rudely awakened. The singular and original seemed to be his chief aim. And that free-willing quality that Mr. Tomasek found so off-putting is the very thing that most of us find so irresistible about this concerto. For Beethoven's listeners, the key of C major would have suggested something grand. Mozart's epic Jupiter Symphony, which was written less than 10 years prior to this piece, was in C major just as one example. And right from the beginning, Beethoven gives us exactly what we wouldn't expect. Instead of a big, majestic opening, we get this quiet little figure in the strings, and right off the bat, it sounds like he is playing a game with us. And the soloist's entrance is just as unusual as the orchestra's. So typically in an 18th century concerto, the orchestra would play a long introduction, and when the solo instrument came in, they would repeat the opening. It's a very clear landmark in concertos like these. But when the piano enters in this concerto, it doesn't play that first theme. It doesn't play the second theme or any other theme we've heard so far. It plays a meandering little tune that we haven't heard before at all and one that won't appear again in the rest of the concerto. So no grand entrance for our soloist. They begin by just noodling through this weird little musical non sequitur. And it's one of the many surprising moments in the first movement of this concerto, which I am sure that you'll enjoy. Let's listen.
the second movement starts out in a way that you might call conventionally beautiful with these lyrical embellished melodies between the soloist and the orchestra. The clarinet in particular is almost a second soloist in this movement. And it's quite beautiful and relatively straightforward for about two thirds of the way through. The thing about really good composers is that they know when you, the audience member, are going to space out. And that's where they drop in something interesting. So just when you've kind of drifted off listening to this slow, pretty second movement, Beethoven brings the piano back, repeats its opening melody, but its delicate accompaniment has turned into an old fashioned oom chuck chuck. Totally out of the blue, you can't miss this. And the piano continues with this triple time oom pa pa thing for the rest of the movement. But the clarinet doesn't get the memo. It just carries on with all of the tunes and rhythms from the first part of the piece. And it creates this magical effect where the clarinet and the piano are playing together but kind of in different time zones. And they become more and more diffuse until at the end they just melt away. It's a stunning way to wrap up this beautiful movement. Let's take a listen.
finally we have the third movement, which like a lot of Beethoven finales, is just a fun, wild ride. One of Beethoven's favorite techniques throughout all of his music is putting accents on the wrong beats, which is just putting an accent on the wrong musical syllable. And you'll hear that trademark technique of his throughout this movement. We also hear Beethoven exploiting the range of the piano, which he loved to do. And piano development was in its heyday during his lifetime. So as the range of the instrument grew, his writing grew right along with it. So keep an ear out for the many passages where the piano thumps around in the low register. It's one of the things that gives this movement its goofy, Bugs Bunny kind of quality, and I think it will make you smile. Take a listen.
it's been a pleasure talking with you about this concerto. Mark your calendars for the next BCO Sundays at 3 on January 31st. Jonathan Pilevsky of WBJC will be talking with pianist Benjamin Pasternak about his take on this adventurous concerto, and Benjamin will also give a special performance of Liszt's Mephisto Waltz. See you next time.